Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome to this Plymouth Linnaean Lecture, a public event uh, presented by the School of Biological Sciences at the University in association with the Linnaean Society of London. As you may be aware, we have a pretty full house this evening, which is not surprising given our speaker and the importance of the topic that she'll be addressing. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, I'd like to say a few words about the Linnaean Society, which I'm representing this evening as the, one of the scientific secretaries and as a vice president. And it gives me further pe personal pre um, pleasure to do so as a born and bred Devonian. Although London-based, the Society is keen to develop a program of events outside the capital, and it was thanks to the enthusiasm and initiative of Dr. Rich Bowden from the university, he himself a fellow of the Linnaean Society, that the Society's association with the lecture came about this evening. We're very grateful, Rich. The Linnaean Society was founded as long ago as 1788, which makes it the oldest biological science society in the world. The founder and first president was James, later Sir James, Edward Smith, who purchased the collection of the great Swedish natural historian Carl Linnaeus and brought it, brought it to Britain. This extraordinary collection is housed today at the Society's rooms in Burlington House, Piccadilly. Linnaeus was the founding father of taxonomy, the classification of animals and plants, who established the binomial system of nomenclature by which animal plant and plants are given two names, for example, Homo sapiens for humans. The system has been used by biologists to this very day, and many of the common animals and plants we encounter were named by Carl Linnaeus in the 18th century. Today, the society embraces uniquely the entire sweep of natural history. It promotes a study of all aspects of biological sciences, with particular emphasis on evolution, taxonomy, biodiversity, and sustainability. It encourages and communicates scientific advances in these and associated fields through its three world-class journals, special publications, messages, uh, uh, meetings, and websites. At the same time, the society reaches out to future biologists through schools and educational programs. Indeed, the society's educational officer, Hazel Leeper, has come from London today and has provided details of the society that you've seen outside. And for anyone interested in becoming a fellow of the society or wanting further information, do catch Hazel or me after the lecture. Or if you miss us, have a look on the website. The Society's special interest in biodiversity and deep concern about its decline means that we're delighted to be associated with the lecture this evening. And it's a very special pleasure to welcome our speaker, Professor Camille Parmesan, who is National Marine Aquarium Chair in the Public Understanding of Oceans and Human Health at the Marine Institute of this university, and also Professor in Integrative Biology at the University of Texas at Austin in the USA. Professor Parmesan's research focused on the current impacts of climate change on wildlife, from field-based work on American and European butterflies to synthetic analyses of global impacts on a broad range of species across terrestrial and marine biomes. Her analyses documenting the global extent and pervasiveness of the effects of human-induced climate change on biodiversity have helped support arguments in policy sectors for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions she works actively with governmental agencies and NGOs to help develop conservation assessment and planning tools aimed at biodiversity in the face of climate change. Professor Parmesan has received numerous scientific awards. She was ranked the second most highly cited author in the field of climate change from 1999 to 2009 by the Reuters Web of Science. She was named the 2013 Distinguished Scientist by Texas Academy of Sciences and named Fellow of the Ecological Society of America. She was awarded the Conservation Achievement Award in Science by the National Wildlife Federation, named Outstanding Woman Working on Climate Change by the IUCN, and named as a who's who of women in the environment um, by the United Nations Environment Programme. She's worked with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for more than 15 years and is a co-recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize awarded to the IPCC in 2007. 
I should add that she is struggling with the most awful infection she's recovering from. And you will see lined up on on the table down here and in front um, a a variety of medications which we hope will get her through this lecture. But without further ado, and on behalf of the University of Plymouth and the Linnean Society of London, it's a very special pleasure for me to invite Professor Camille Parmesan to speak to us this evening on biodiversity and climate change um, connecting the past to the future. Camille. Well, I am going to be talking about biodiversity and climate change. It has been what I've been working on for about the past 15 years. Um, but I also want to talk about how, how, we, how the science comes about, because without having a history, we can't know what's changed. And the work of the Linnaean Society actually goes along with, uh, with that aim very, very well. We'll get to that in a minute. So global warming, this is the term that people use when they think of uh, what humans are doing to the, to the planet in terms of being caused by rise in atmospheric gases. Um, but I show this because I, when I was first starting to work with climate scientists about 15 years ago, I'd go to these very small meetings with some of the top global top climate scientists and they were saying, oh, we've got to get rid of this word global warming. We've got to get everyone using the word climate change. And I said, why are you guys so worried about, do you know, what word is used? And they said, look, global warming, people think every spot is warming, and that's not true. And you can see that on this map, that there are some spots that are cooling. So the warming is in the warmer tones, the oranges to reds, and the coolings are in the blue tones. And there are areas that have had a cooling trend over the last 50 years. Overall, most places are warming, so you get this general annual global warming that we hear about, but it's not true for every single spot on the world. And the other reason they didn't like it is they said, look, what we think is going to happen, remember this is 15 years ago, what we think is going to happen is that we really are going into a new climate state. So we're going to be in this transitional period for maybe 100, 200 more years, And during this transitional period, climate is going to not just gradually change, it's going to become destabilized. And so anthropogenic climate change is going to cause all kinds of climate extremes that people aren't going to think of when they just hear the words global warming. And I said, well, what what sorts of things are you talking about? And one of the first things they said was Arctic excursions. I'm like, what's an Arctic excursion? Well, 15 years later, we found out. So this is January 2010. This is Great Britain. And you can see a satellite image where the, almost the entirety, of, actually the entirety of Great Britain, maybe little spots here and there, is covered in snow and ice. An astonishing photo. <laughs> and when this happened, I remember that people were starting to say, ah, global warming's not real, it's not happening. We've had an amazingly cold winter, not quite record, but near record. So one of the problems with climate change is people think very parochially. They think of what's happening in their backyard. And if their backyard is cold, by God, global warming's not happening. If their backyard is hot and dry, oh, they're, they're a believer. But what we need to all be doing is looking at the global scale of the problem. So here's the same data for the globe in January 2010. And you can see Great Britain is quite a bit colder than normal. Uh, it's actually not a record. Uh, Siberia was, was much colder than, than um, Britain was compared to normal. But look what's happening in the Arctic. So all that cold air was rushing down to northern Eurasia, which meant the Arctic was losing the cold and heating up. So those Arctic excursions are caused normally that that circumpolar air mass is very stable. The cold air stays up over the North Pole. With climate destabilization driven by anthropogenic climate change, you're getting these excursions going down. Cold air blows out, but that means the Arctic warms up more than ever. So on a global scale, even for that one month of January, you can see, again, almost everywhere was warming, and not just warming by a little, 
but if you were up in the North Pole, you were warming by a lot. And so again, January 2010 was actually one of the warmest Januaries on record, in spite of the fact that Great Britain was covered with snow and ice. We've had the same thing happen again this January, now it's the Eastern USA. Eastern USA has been hit by snow um, and ice storms for months. They actually de I was talking with the National Academy yesterday and they were again closed down in DC, uh, told not to come to work because of another snowstorm. I was in Texas for a little while. We had repeated ice storms that shut down the whole city. And again, people started saying, aha, global warming's not real, it's not happening. But if you look globally, which is what you should be doing, what you can see is very few areas actually did have that cold, those colder temperatures. Quite a lot of areas had record highs. And again, overall, averaged over the whole globe, you've had actually a very warm January. So what is all of this, uh, what has climate change been, been driving other than these extreme highs uh, and extreme lows? Well, we've had a taste of that in the UK. As you can see, if you go back to January, this past January, it wasn't really all that uh, particularly warmer or colder in the UK, but we've had these massive gales, these massive storms coming through, incredible storm surge, and that actually is the wave, not a cloud, if you look at it closely. And this, everyone living in Plymouth has lost our train. We can't get to London without going on a bus. So again, 15 years ago, this is something that climate scientists were predicting, that increased storm surge caused by two things. One, it's just directly the warmer temperatures hold more water. It increases the energy for the hydrological cycle. So they do expect more floods, or did expect more floods. We are getting more floods. Um, but also sea level has risen by about something like eight inches over the past century. It doesn't sound like much, but a very tiny rise in average sea level actually uh, is magnified when you get a storm and you get a much higher storm surge than you'd expect from just that little eight inch rise in sea level. And again, uh, if you look globally at the situation, we have an overall increase in precipitation, but this increase in the hydrological cycle has gone along with changes in movement of air masses. And so what climate scientists predicted 15 years ago was not just increased floods, overall increase in precip, that's happened, increase in floods, that's happened in many areas, but also an increase in droughts. And so if you look at this map for January, here's the, the record precipitation rainfall for uh, Great Britain showing up, a few other places had record rainfall, but many other places had record drought. So again, it's not that you, this, cha this change isn't gradual. It's not gradual increase in temperature, gradual rise in rainfall. We're getting an increase in extreme events as the climate both gets more energy in its whole system and becomes destabilized as it's going through this transitional state to a new uh, climate regime. Okay, so what does this all mean for wildlife? That's what I really work on. Well, what do we expect this to be doing to wildlife? We can look at the fossil evidence to give us some indication of what happened when the climate changed fairly rapidly in the past, which it has. And so if you look at uh, the evidence from this one beetle called the Arctic beetle, <coughs> what you can see is it's called the Arctic beetle because right now it lives way up in the Arctic, um, in the far, far north of, of Fenniscandia. But if you go back about 12,000 years, which was towards the uh, very end of the last glacial period, you found it all over Great Britain. And as the climate warmed over the last 12,000 years, this beetle gradually migrated northward until its final resting place up in the uh, far boreal tundra. So and we see this with many, many, many species. Beetles are really good because they provide a hard skeleton. You get good fossils. You get good pollen data from some of the um, trees that have a lot of pollen, like oaks. And we see these sort of northward, poleward range shifts of one to 3,000 kilometers as you go from a glacial period to an interglacial, which is what we're at now. So we expect then, if we're having just a little bit of warming, we may not be seeing range shifts of 
two or three thousand kilometers, but you'd expect to be seeing some kind of movement of species in that direction. Well, that's when I first got into climate change. It was back in the early 1990s when the climate scientists were not yet sure anthropogenic climate change was happening. Uh, they, in theory, they believed it should happen because of rising greenhouse gas emissions, but they didn't have the actual, the data, the climate data uh, was not yet showing a significant trend. And I was working on this butterfly up here, Edith's checker spot, a Euphydris editha, and I should say it's a very close relative to a butterfly you have here, the marsh fritillary, which is just right up in Dartmoor. Uh, so close that actually I've been able to work on the marsh fritillary almost, you know, off the get-go because they're so very, very similar. So I'd been working with Edith's checker spot back in, this is going back to 1992 now. I'd been working on it for some years on the basic ecology evolution behavior, doing a lot of field work, and we knew from work going all the way back to Parle Ehrlich in the 1950s that this butterfly was very, very sensitive to yearly climate variability. If you had a drought, the population numbers went down. If you had a year with a, a nice level of, of rainfall, the population numbers went up. A very, very sensitive to snowfall, rainfall, temperature changes from year to year. So I thought, well, if anything is going to be responding to climate change, a gradual change in that climate, this butterfly would be doing it. So I want to describe why this is such a good butterfly for working on this. And one of the reasons is it lives in a lot of very different habitats. So for those of you who don't know the Western USA, uh, this butterfly actually lives all the way from Mexico up to Canada, which I'm not showing you, and all the way from the Pacific coast of California to Colorado, way over here, which I'm not showing you. But these next few photos are gonna be going from the seaside uh, in uh, uh, the coast of California, up into the coastal foothills here. We forget the Central Valley, that's all a, a breadbasket agricultural field, so we bop way over to these foothills of the mountains, of the Sierra Nevada Mountains, go up and then over into the Great Basin, the Basin and Range region of Nevada. So let me show you, this is one species, remember, who's living in all of these different habitats. Lives in coastal meadows, right at the seaside, just gorgeous. Everywhere you go, it lives in beautiful places. It, it, um, unless humans have driven it extinct by causing LA and San Diego. But everywhere where there's still habitat, it's absolutely gorgeous. Big, beautiful flowery meadows into the coastal foothills of California and Oregon, and then going up into the uh, foothills of the Sierra Nevada and the Cascades, up into the mountains. So now we're at fairly high elevation. We're at 10,000 feet and you've still got the same species, and up to the very highest point where you actually have vegetation, uh, 12,040 feet. So these little tufts of vegetation, uh, that it's the highest point we've got them. This is this little host plant that you see. If you look close, you've got the little host plant. And these places are very remote. Uh, I actually, this, to get to this spot was an all-day backpacking trip where you had to leave at 5 in the morning and we didn't get back till 10 at night. Some of these sites were actually two and three day backpacking trips to get to. So very remote locations. And that's another beauty of this species is that it lives in a lot of areas where we still have good habitat. So that you can actually separate the impacts of land use change you can ignore LA and San Diego and San Francisco, just say, okay, I'm not gonna worry about that because there's so many other places that are still gorgeous where it exists. You go up over the mountains, over the Cascades, over the Sierra Nevada, you get into these beautiful wet meadows. Um, doesn't look like desert yet, but uh, there you go. Wet meadows with wild irises in. But very quickly, within about 15 minutes drive of that spot, you start getting into the basin and range region. And the butterflies are not down here in the, in the desert parts, although this is quite high elevation. They're up in, um, in these ranges. It's a whole series of mountain ranges bisecting this desert, and they're right up at the tops of here, associated again with little tiny springs and tiny little wet meadows. And this area is extremely um, devoid of people. You can do field work out here and literally not see people for days. And I had the most amazing experience when we were camping at one of these sites where I woke up in the middle of the night, I don't know what woke me up, and I thought, God, that's 
awfully bright moon because you know you're in your tent and I go outside and there isn't a moon there's absolutely no moon at all and I realized I was seeing the starlight the sky was absolutely filled with stars it is one of the if you look at, at a night lights map it is a dark spot the whole of Nevada is a dark spot just an amazing experience Okay, so it lives in all these incredibly different habitats. So obviously it's not going to eat the same thing everywhere. It's, these are all plants within the, the families Plantagenaceae and Orobanchaceae. Used to be Scrofulariaceae for the botanist out there. Most of these you're not going to be familiar with, but this little guy is the swordleaf plantain. It actually is an exotic. It's an invasive weed in the western USA, brought in with the cattle. That one you're very uh, familiar with. And the rest of these are, are American natives, but they're all in those two families, but very, very different plants, uh, living in very, very different places. And it turns out this is one of the, so we're starting to get to why this is such a good butterfly to do a climate change project on is it doesn't move. It's very, very sedentary, just like the marsh fritillary, actually, which doesn't move. It lives and dies in the same little 100, 200 meter patch that its parents and grandparents and great grandparents lived and died. So we're not talking about a migratory species. We're not talking about something that moves around a lot. And so imagine something that lives in one spot with, for generations and generations, you go a little ways further and you're in a different habitat, different host plant, different elevation, slightly different climate. You can imagine then that, that these little groups evolve very, very differently from each other. And so these are all Euphydris edith. These are all Edith's checker spot, but they look very, very different depending on which of these ecotypes you got them from. And these differences are, are highly heritable. In other words, they're very strongly genetically based. These are not changes that come about from how they're living. You take them into the lab and you will still get all of these very, very different color patterns. Why am I so excited about that? Well, getting back to what I said earlier about you cannot tell if anything has changed unless you have a historical baseline. For very many species, we do not have a historical baseline. And I'm here trying to look for the rain shift like we see with those beetles. So I want big geographic scale. And if you think of the way most collectors work, they know one good spot to get something for their collection because that's where everyone's gone. So they go to that same spot, they pick it up, they put it in their collection. So you get you know, hundreds or even thousands of records from very few spots within the range of the species. That's no good for looking at rain shifts, right? You need more geographic space. So the brilliant thing about this is in the early part of the 20th century, because they looked different, taxonomists classified each of these ecotypes as a different species. Now, if you're a good butterfly collector, you want one of every species in your collection. So therefore, the collections had the entire geographic range of Edith's checker spot recorded in specimens in museums because they were trying to catch each of these species. Now, that's brilliant for someone wanting to come along and look for change because now you've got the history, you've got that historical baseline. So that's what I went out to do. Again, this was 1992, nothing was digitized, there were no online databases. We're actually still not quite where we need to be to do this kind of work. So I had to find those collections, which meant I had to go around to museums around the world, including the Natural History Museum in London, and look at their specimens and, and uh, go through, and I don't know if you can see, there are tiny little pieces of paper you pick up each one of these, you tug at that little piece of paper, and what you're hoping to find is something like 1.1 miles up Highway 61 from the junction with 64 at 2,150 meters on the south slope. Brilliant. And you go to that spot and boom, you hopefully find the, find the spot. Now, why did I say I have to go to that spot? It's because most of these sites, again, butterfly collectors, they go to a spot, they collect it, they go back, they put it in their collection. 
they themselves don't want to go back to that same spot, right? They want to go somewhere else. So for an awful lot of these spots, I had one or two records. One record from, for example, the, in the Natural History Museum, there was a Mrs. Nickel who went to Canada. And Mrs. Nickel went, and she was brilliant. She went all over Canada. I don't know how she did this, because her records are from the 1860s. So I'd have a record from Big White Mountain from Mrs. Nickel, 1860, beautifully recorded exactly where that spot was, but then nothing. In any museum, I go to the American Museum, I go to San Diego Museum, I go around the world, there is not another record for Big White Mountain, except that one from Mrs. Nickel. Therefore, I've got to go to Big White Mountain. Such a, such a shame. So I just spent about four and a half years doing field work, sort of looking up all of these, as many sites as I possibly could. And the good thing about doing that is I could then verify that that site was still suitable habitat. If it was still suitable habitat, I asked, is the butterfly still there? I won't bore you with the census details. It often took either many days or sometimes multiple visits. But um, because I'd been working on this butterfly for a long time, I was actually able to do this with um, a, a very a, a high degree of confidence that I was really figuring out whether or not the butterfly was there. And if I determined it was extinct, it went on this map as a purple triangle. If I determined it was still present, it went on this map as a green triangle. And what you'll see from this is that there are a lot, I should, I should uh, say, because this butterfly is very sensitive to climate, we know it goes extinct easily. So just finding an extinction doesn't tell you much. It's the pattern of extinctions. We know they go extinct in drought years. We know they go extinct in, extinct in extreme uh, cold years. So it's not finding a population that's gone extinct. It's finding one, it's extinct. The habitat is still gorgeous. Lots of host plant, lots of nectar plants. And then putting that together in the pattern looking across the geographic range. So what I found is lots of extinctions down at the southern end of its range in Mexico, southern California. Again, there would be a lot more dots here if it weren't for LA and San Diego because most of those populations have been destroyed by urbanization. Not talking about those today. So these are extinctions in areas that are still good habitat. So about 80% of the populations have gone extinct down in the south, about 40% through the mid part of the range. You get up into Canada to those sites uh, that Mrs. Nichols looked at, they were almost all still there. Less than 20% of the sites had gone extinct. And so this butterfly, if you, if you let, take the average location of a population, it had moved northward by 92 kilometers, which amazingly is exactly what you'd expect from the 0.7 degrees centigrade warming that has occurred in this region. It astonished me. You'd expect 105 kilometers, it moved 92. I couldn't have imagined a, a, a better result looking for climate change impacts. And then again, it goes from sea level to high elevation. So you can also look for upward range shifts and what I found there is that the lower elevations below 8,000 feet, about 40% had gone extinct, but you get to those highest mountains, and these are only in the Sierra Nevada of California. That's only where they get high enough, and the extinctions go to less than 15%. So the very highest elevation populations are doing really well. The very highest latitude populations are doing really well, much better than anything else. So over the course, of about 100, 150 years, this butterfly has moved its entire range northward and upward, exactly at a rate you'd expect from the warming trends. Now, I'm talking again about average warming, average annual warming, but I do want to remind you that we know as biologists that it is the extreme events that really influence the populations. So if you go down to San Diego, Mexico, this is the ecotype, so that's the habitat, that's what it looks like. Um, they're sort of up on these mountaintops in the area. They're not, they don't tend to be way down in the valleys. Uh, this is the Kino checker spot. It's an endangered subspecies, actually, because of LA and San Diego. Uh, but as you can see, the habitats down in Mexico actually were really, were really good looking. So it's, um, uh, that's not the reason you had high extinction in Mexico. That's its host plant, this little plantain. It actually is a, a, a member of the same plantain you've got here, but it's an annual. Little, that is an adult plant. This part of the world has rainfall from about November to about February. 
For the rest of the year, you get zero rain, not a drop. So the butterflies are, have to, to um, grow really fast to go through a whole generation on these tiny, tiny little plants before they dry up. They're annuals. They dry up every year. They set seed. They don't, the seeds don't germinate again until the next uh, November, December. So what happens when you get a little bit of warming and a little bit of drying, which is what's happened in Southern California and Northern Mexico, is the, pl the, the insects speed up a little bit. It's warmer, so the insects grow a little bit faster, but they cannot keep up with the plants that are drying out even faster. So the plants dry out too soon. The, the butterfly lays her eggs, her caterpillars hatch out. They try to feed, they have to feed for 10 days to be able to go into rest for nine months until the uh, next rainfall. And if they only have five or six days, the population will go extinct. So this is very, this process of, of the butterfly and its host plant getting out of sync is very likely what drove the high population extinctions down in the southern part of its range. So again, drought years, heat waves are what's gonna drive that. You go up into the mountains, what's happening? Well, at the very highest elevations, you get a really big snowpack. Butterflies don't come out till late July. That's good because in late July, August, California is bright blue sky, warm temperatures every single day, and they just bomb through their life cycle and they're back they go through a whole generation. They're back asleep by early September when the snows start again. You go down the mountains just a little bit to that sort of 7,000 foot line which does get snow, it's high enough to get snow, but what's been happening with uh, warming trends is the snowpack has been lighter, spring has been warmer, you're getting rain when you used to get snow, so the snowpack is melting about two weeks earlier, significantly earlier, and when that happens, the butterflies that should be coming out at 7,000 to 8,000 feet, they should be coming out in late May, June, we've seen them coming out as early as April, when they come out in April, as adults, they are then very sensitive to what is a normal winter snowfall. Because April, you're still having some cold weather, you can get the freak snowfall, and when that happens, the adults are not able to take it, they die very, very rapidly, and a series of these, uh, what are called false spring events, Right? It's, it's the butterflies coming out really too early for the winter weather. These fall spring events drove a whole set of populations at about 7,500 feet extinct. So again, it's, it's these extreme events, these fall springs, droughts, uh, extreme temperatures of one kind or another that are causing these populations to go extinct, and they're going extinct faster down at the southern end and at lower elevations than at the northern end and at high elevations. And if any of you know Chris Thomas, he's a, a UK butterfly biologist that just been named a fellow of the Royal Society, but this is how he started in the Sierra Nevadas of California. Now, I told you I spent four and a half years to get data on one butterfly moving its range northward and upward in the USA, uh, North America, sorry. I knew that we needed data on more species, but quite frankly, I had worked on the best one we had in North America. So to get data on a lot more species, I had to come to Europe. You have much, much better databases. Uh, you've had a long history, especially in the northern countries, of naturalists going out and collecting uh, insects of all kinds and, and collecting data, not necessarily individuals, but collecting data on when flowers bloom, when birds start singing, when birds start mating. So getting these historical baselines is, is actually, the UK is the best country in the world for having these historical baselines because they have such a rich history of amateur natural historians who thankfully kept good notes or good, mu uh, good specimens that they donated to museums. So I came to the UK, fantastic number of butterflies you can work on. But I had to, again, deal with land use change. So you had to have some kind of handle 
on what the habitats the butterflies required and how those habitats had changed over the past hundred years. Because you, lots of cha uh, changes in where things live have occurred because of land use change. And you're trying to tease that apart from impacts of climate change. So I couldn't do this alone, <coughs> even if I'd had all the data. Um, and I had this whole bevy of experts help me to get data all the way from the southern edge of species ranges, from down in northern Africa, Spain and France, up to their northern edges of their ranges up in the UK, Sweden, Finland, and Estonia. Now, it may strike you that almost everyone here is male, and that, is, uh, that isn't random. If you look at the kind of information I needed, I needed people not only who knew the databases very well, but who knew the butterflies really well and had been looking at butterflies for a long time, so had actually seen a lot of the land use changes that we were concerned about. Every one of the men in this picture, except Brian Huntley, uh, who's a modeler, <coughs> collected butterflies when they were a kid. This is something little boys do. I don't know why little girls don't do it, but it's something little boys do. And they not only collected them, most of them had reared butterflies when they were nine years old, including my husband, Mike Singer. He's very proud to have raised a blue on one P. Um, <coughs> and the two women in the study, me and Jane, got into this as graduate students. So it was incredibly working with these guys their level of expertise, the depth of their knowledge, the richness of their knowledge was just absolutely amazing and it made the whole project possible. So again, you know, if they had never become scientists, those, those natural history observations when they were children actually still would have been very valuable, but the fact that they then went on to become butterfly biologists and were able to put it all into context uh, just made this an incredible project. So again, <coughs> we had to deal with land use change, but in, the, in North America, I could just say, well, I wanna to go to places that are undisturbed, right? And there were lots of places like that. I wasn't very limited. In Europe, you don't have places that are undisturbed. You've had humans around for, uh, you know, not just around, but, but um, with agriculture and grazing and building cities for thousands and thousands of years. So the idea of land use change here is so very different. This isn't, uh, you know, for example, this is an endangered species. It's uh, the Glanville fritillary, Melotea kingsia. This is its habitat right here where Jeremy Thomas is standing, right by a tourist beach. And I, it was hard for me to grasp my head around this, that these were the habitats we were looking at. But we go out with Jeremy, who's the local expert. Uh, well, he's actually a, a global expert in butterfly biology as well. But he was the local expert on the Glanville fritillary. And he said, oh, yes, this is brilliant habitat. It's great. OK, all right, I have to, to trust you on that one. And we did find the butterfly, <laughs> so it was not extinct. And so it turns out that what you're looking for is not undisturbed habitat, habitat, but traditionally managed habitats. So I had to learn what traditional management was, that it's, you know, you go up into the Alps and the Pyrenees, it means that the sheep don't have fences. They are actually herded around by the shepherd and his sheepdog. It means that you've got uh, traditional hay meadows and by that, it means you're not fertilizing, you're not putting seed down, you're simply letting, I mean, look at this incredible biodiversity uh, that is cut once or twice a year for hay, but not messed with in any other way. And fortunately, we were able to find a set of species that used places where this kind of habitat was still available so that we could look for the climate change impacts. And you go to these areas with traditional management, the biodiversity is amazing. Uh, there are certain parts in the Alps and southern France that rival the tropics. And I mean really rival the tropics. Having been down to Costa Rica uh, I, I, and then coming up into the Alps and southern France, I was just, you know, dozens of, you walk through and there are hundreds of butterflies flitting up as you walk and it's not all one species. You're looking at dozens of species. Just incredible. And yet you go into some other areas like Germany and Austria, and this is actually from Germany, 
looks like a beautiful green field. You get a little closer, it's like, okay, well, there are flowers. You get a little closer and you find it's like two species of grass and one flower. No biodiversity. It's biologically sterile. So this, what's the difference, is this one has had fertilizer added. That's all you've got to do. You don't even have to put seeds down of alfalfa. You add a bit of fertilizer and boom, you have lost the biodiversity. So I literally could not include Germany in this study because there were not enough places that had traditional habitat. One thing I love about having arrived in the UK is that this maintenance of butterflies and birds and flowers is considered very important by almost everyone I meet. And it's, it's, it's um, something that's supported at all levels of society. This is Miriam Rothschild and this is her estate. This is her house that she lived in until she died. And she was quite happy to let nature take over. And uh, she was so pleased that she had this very rare butterfly, the checkered skipper. Her estate was the last place it was known from. And she was so pleased about that that she named the pub in the village the checkered skipper and had a, a little statue of it drawn. And unfortunately, it has now gone extinct. Um, but it, it held out in, in her estate longer than anywhere else. So you've got this incredible support here for maintaining these sorts of traditional management techniques. So, but I did have to, again, do a lot of field work, not so much to get the database this time, but just to make sure that the habitats really were still okay. And so I suffered through about oh, a couple of years of going around and being forced to swing a net in all kinds of weather. It was a lot of fun. And at the end of the two years, we came up with some wonderful result. It's not just Edith's checker spot butterfly moving north. We've got about two thirds of the butterflies that we'd looked at moving northward in the UK, uh, in Sweden, in uh, Finland, in Estonia. So this is the purple emperor, which some of you might know. I think it's either very rare or extinct in Britain. No, not extinct, not extinct but fine. very, very rare. And it was not known from Sweden and Finland until the 1980s, it started showing up. Um, immediately got collected. It was kind of astonishing that it managed, to, that it wasn't driven extinct by collectors, but it held out. And uh, just in ju as soon as it kind of made it up there and started populations, in just another five years, it colonized another 200 kilometers northward. Amazing, amazing northward rain shifts. So I've, I, my own field work is largely on butterflies, but I have work with the databases for all kinds of species. And I want to show you uh, some, uh, some sort of the broader picture, not just the butterflies. And uh, one of the interesting things is what's happening in the oceans. So when you look at the temperature change, it looks like the oceans aren't changing very much. And so a lot of biologists were concentrating on changes in these areas that are really heating up. But I was part of a working group at the National Center for Ecological Analysis, Analysis and Synthesis down in uh, Santa Barbara, California. And one of the first things we did is we said, well, you know, in the oceans, you have what we call a very shallow temperature gradient. So it's a particular temperature, and that temperature doesn't change for a very, very, very long uh, space. It takes you, you have to move a long ways to get a different temperature in the ocean without climate change. So if you add a little bit of climate change on top, what are species who want to maintain a temperature going to have to do? Well, we came up with a map that would depict that. So this is the movement of temperature space through uh, geographic areas. And now that the redder the space, the faster that temperature is moving. And what you see then is now the oceans are actually, species in the ocean are experiencing just as much climate change as species on land, if you think in terms of them trying to maintain that temperature space. And actually in some areas, they uh, have much faster rates of temperature change. So a species that lives here in the ocean wanting to maintain the same temperature with a little bit of temperature rise is going to have to move a much longer distance than a species on land with that same level of temperature rise. D uh, does that make sense to everybody? Oh, good. It's a little bit hard to explain. 
so no big surprise when we put the databases together. Now this isn't just butterflies. This is all species for which we have data around the world. And we compare marine and land. What we see is on land, on the terrestrial systems, the rate of movement on average across hundreds of species is about six to 17 kilometers per decade. And voila, it's several times faster than that in the oceans. So speech, wild species in the oceans are having to move much further, and they are doing it. They're not just having to do it. They're actually moving much further in an attempt to maintain the same temperature space. But if you look at those extremes, it's interesting that they're not all that different. So we've got the purple emperor that moved 200 kilometers in five years, but we've got the Atlantic cod that moved 200 kilometers in a decade, and then this species of diatom moved 400 kilometers in a decade. So the extremes are not that different, it's just that on average we are seeing bigger movements in the marine systems. But a lot of variability, okay? Big difference between six kilometers a decade and 400 kilometers a decade, right? But we're seeing everything under the sun. And it's not just happening at those northern latitudes. So we are seeing tropical species moving upward into the temperate zone. So from Africa into Spain uh, and from Mexico into Texas and California. And we're seeing even bigger changes in behavior. So we're seeing birds who used to be migrant birds turning into resident, overwintering residents. They used to go down south every winter. Now the winters are warm enough that they can spend the whole winters there. And mountaintop species are moving up. It's not just Editha, the Apollo butterfly is moving up in uh, France and in Nepal. And there's this cute little mammal uh, related to the rabbit, a pika, who's moving upward in the USA and Nepal. And when I say moving upward, it's that they're already mountaintop species and those lower elevation populations are going extinct. So they're really contracting upward and being forced into a smaller and smaller space. The other kind of change that we expect to see is change in timing of spring events. A lot more data on that. Uh, and we have enough data that we're seeing differences between groups. So amphibians like frogs are um, changing the fastest. Uh, they're advancing their spring calling by eight days per decade. Birds and butterflies are advancing faster than our herbs. And fish are, and zooplankton are advancing faster than phytoplankton. Now, the reason I bring this up is that butterflies eat herbs, right? That's their host plants. And fish and zooplankton eat phytoplankton. So we're starting to see predator-prey systems getting out of sync because the predators are advancing faster than their prey. So I'm talking about all of these things moving around the world. And aren't any of them causing problems? Funny enough, most of them are not. Most, you know, the uh, purple emperor moves into Sweden joins the biodiversity, uh, the, the Swedish butterfly biodiversity, increases the richness in Sweden and actually isn't doing any harm. But we are seeing some pretty dramatic invasions as well, such as this long spine sea urchin. It's moved down from Australia into Tasmania as the waters have warmed, so it can now reproduce there. And <laughs> the reason this is a problem is the urchin eats up all the kelp forest, so rich, happy kelp forest that used to be the nursery ground for fish is now a, a urchin barren. Why is it able to become invasive? Well, there's one predator left, it's this big spiny lobster, and this lobster is about this big, okay? Huge thing. And it does eat the, the urchin. This is taken in the field, so in the ocean. But the only place where it's doing this is in marine protected areas because everywhere else it's overfished. And of course the biggest sizes are fished more. So not only do you have fewer lobsters outside in, in the fished area, but you don't have those biggest size classes. So this is a, a beautiful example, and there are a lot of other examples I could give you of the fact that when the system, when the ecosystem is healthy, when it's protected, when it's diverse, when it has its full component of, of natural predators, this exotic species can come in and simply join the biodiversity. And it's kept in control by native predators, even though it is an exotic. But where you've disrupted the system, where you have an unhealthy system, where you've overfished, then that urchin is 
very, very easily able to become invasive and destroy, degrade and destroy habitat because nothing's around to keep it under control. So if you don't remember anything else from tonight, I hope you remember that one of the key things conservation biologists are working at doing and should do is to actually try to restore the health of the systems we have left, try to expand protected areas, and try to restore areas that are degraded back to health so that biodiversity as a whole is both more resistant and more resilient to anthropogenic climate change. So I'm gonna switch gears here a little because I've been talking about impacts on wildlife. And that is what I do for a living generally. But because I've worked in the USA for uh, most of my professional life, I've had to deal with a lot of climate deniers. Only about 42% of Americans believe that humans are causing climate change. And so even though I am a scientist and I work on wild species, I have felt compelled to get involved in the communication of science to policymakers uh, and, and to open bridges with groups who themselves lack the expertise and the knowledge to try to get more people understanding the science behind what's happening. One of these expeditions was actually uh, something that PBS and Harvard Medical School organized. It, the idea was we're gonna take five scientists and five evangelicals to Alaska to jointly experience climate change. Why did they choose evangelicals? Two reasons. One is the evangelical movements in the USA have been historically fairly anti-science, and this is driven a lot by being anti-evolution. Um, and also that evangelicals, though, are very, very powerful. And they're a way to reach people who don't necessarily have a science education. Now, there's a group of evangelicals that have decided that uh, they're intelligent people. They actually do believe in science. And they've decided that climate change is something that um, is impacting their ability to do what God wanted them to do, which is take care of creation. So a small group has actually wanted to combat climate change and is trying to educate the rest of the public. And what's interesting is we're going to the far north, and Linnaeus himself actually went up <laughs> to the boreal regions. And it would be really fascinating to go back, get his journals, which I'm sure he took meticulous notes of his whole journey, and retake the journey that he took to look at all the changes as well. Now, I know you're wondering why I'm bringing this up in the UK, because you're probably thinking, well, we don't have this problem in the UK. Everyone accepts anthropogenic climate change. But actually, you do have some key people um, who clearly are climate change deniers. Uh, and he, uh, quote, people get very emotional about climate change, and I think we should just accept that climate has been changing for centuries, meaning that humans aren't driving it. Now, if it were just his belief system, I frankly wouldn't care. Every, you know, everyone has a right to believe whatever they want to believe, but it does impact policy uh, because of his position. So under uh, Patterson, funding has been halved and the staff working on climate change adaptation, such as flood prevention, prevention has gone down from 38 staff members to six. So his belief system is having a real impact on the UK's ability to adapt to the coming climate change that we know is, is already happening, uh, much less going to happen. So I'd like to talk to end with, with what this journey did. And I think it really was a brilliant way to get people together from very, very different viewpoints onto common ground. So we went looking through Alaska. Alaska has have major changes. This is Denali. This, the permanent snow line of the Denali, Mount, Mount Denali, has lifted by 2,000 feet. And this was 2007. It's probably more than that by now. Uh, the spruce bark beetle, the warmer winters <coughs> and longer growing season has allowed a massive outbreak of spruce bark beetle. Millions of acres of spruce have been killed off. And of course, you've got the receding glaciers. The glacier used to come down to here. This is Portage Glacier. It's now a lake. Okay, so we went and we saw all these things, but the most powerful was actually seeing the effect on the people. And that's what, the, the, what I want to leave you with, is it's not just birds and butterflies, it's people too. This is in northwestern Alaska. This is a barrier island of Shishmarov. 
tiny little Inuit village. I think there are about 400 people living there. Very, very poor. They are subsistence living. They are hunter-gatherers. They are not the, it, you have to fly in. It took us three flights to get there. Uh, it's not that far from the, the mainland, but the mainland there has nothing on it. So there's no point taking a boat to the mainland. It's wilderness. You've actually got to fly quite a ways to the next town. That's a teeny little town. Then you have to fly to a slightly bigger town. And then, you know, finally you get to Anchorage. So they don't get fresh food in. Uh, they, again, they, they do use traditional hunting. There's one of the hides. They use snowmobiles, okay, they use boats. Uh, but what, what has climate change done? Well, this is a barrier island. It's made of sand. It was kept intact because the sand was frozen, right? It's tundra. And the sea ice used to come all the way to the shore in the winter, but even in summer, it would only retreat to about there. You could see it. So two things. The sea ice is retreating earlier, so winter storms are lashing out at the coast. This dirt is no longer frozen. It's now thawed down. At the time, it was thawed down two meters, so more than six feet. So you're, you're looking at these winter storms coming in onto a coast that now doesn't have any sea ice in late, uh, late winter, early spring lashing onto land that now has no resistance to those sorts of storms. And so they are literally losing their island. Second thing is they're losing their food sources. So they do hunt caribou and salmon and they hunt berries, but that's all very, very seasonal. The sort of mainstay are the seals. So the seals used to be right on the sea ice that was, you could see it from the mainland and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Now you have to drive a boat several hours to get to the sea ice. When you get there, the seal population has declined by 90%. So their food sources have diminished, their land is going away. And, um, and I should say they can be moved for about one to two million dollars and the government of Alaska has refused to do that. So I want to show you what the reaction uh, was to these, Barrett to this group. Decided, not <laughs> this is an evangelical this Richard Sizek. Potentially is a victim, potentially is a victim of climate change in one way or another. And so that, in my estimation, is a cause so important, I would jeopardize even my job for it. And that's what he did. Earlier this year, a group of prominent evangelicals wrote a letter asking Sizek to resign from the National Association of Evangelicals. One of the signers of the letter was Harry Jackson. And so Rich is out there uh, trumpeting his cause, and he's a great guy. Uh, but we said, hey, as you speak for evangelicals, uh, let's make sure we're on the same page. Richard Sizek's supporters came to his side, and he kept his job and he's now trying to win over one of those skeptics. Rich basically came to me and said, hey, you sound like you're open. Do you want to see more, hear more? Sizek believed that if Jackson came to Alaska with the other evangelicals, it would make all the difference. If they can see and feel and touch and hear all the senses of climate change and its impacts, then they will inevitably decide, I think, to do something about it. Okay, and I'll just show one more quickly. I think Shishmaref was very powerful for our evangelical friends on this trip because the, the human dimension, they are so concerned with, you know, Christ's teaching of helping the poor. We watched as a house fell into the ocean just uh, the day before it began to fall, and we watched as, you know, the ocean came in and began to sweep parts of it away. That's real. That is, uh, that is not hypothetical. It's not in the years to come. It's now. And it's happening to people that God loves. And so this whole trip, I, I should say, actually did have a huge impact on Harry Jackson, who was uh, the person who, when he came, he didn't even really know if climate change was happening. The melting glaciers and all that convinced him. But then he, and he said to me personally, he said, you know, Camille, I, you're a scientist. You obviously know what you're talking about. Okay, I believe you. Humans are causing climate change. But you don't understand. I don't care about the birds and the butterflies. I care about people. And my mission in life has been to help the plight of poor people. After Shishmaref, I had the same talk with him. I said, Harry, how do you feel now? And he said, 
you know, I just, I can't believe it. Now I realize that it's not the birds and the butterflies, that climate change is hurting the most the people I care about the most, the people I have spent my life trying to protect. And so he completely turned around to realizing that if he was going to help the poor, he needed to combat climate change. So I'm, I'm hoping that is the end of my talk, and what I'm hoping is that you've learned a lot, had some fun, but also that regardless of your political persuasion, regardless of what, you know, what are your pet hobbies or what you personally want to, to you know, put your own energies into, I would hope that you can see that climate change is something that is now currently affecting all of us and that I hope that you leave this with a little more motivation to be a bit more active in combating it. Thank you very much. We should be doing both because it's incredible. I'm so glad you brought that up. It's incredibly important that we start planning over the next 50 to 100 years, anticipating these rain shifts and helping species do it, especially in a, in a country like the UK that's very heavily human dominated. They're gonna need a lot of help getting over those agricultural fields, over those urban areas. So we do need to start thinking about recreating or creating new habitats in say degraded lands that maybe aren't prime agriculture, aren't really being used for much right now, actually creating habitats for biodiversity. But we mustn't just think that we can ignore and let go the habitats we've already protected because other things will be coming up and moving into them. So that's all that creating a larger habitat network that will allow this sort of dynamic movement across the landscape is exactly the, the dream of conservation biologists. But absolutely don't give up currently protected areas. They're key both as sources for colonists to move northward and they're key habitats for species from the south to move into. Well, I, I'd like to get away from labeling people and causing more controversy rather than less. I, I really, I, what I loved about the Scientist Evangelical Expedition was that we were coming together knowing we disagreed with each other and trying to find common ground. And I, so I, I don't think it's helpful to name call, um, but I increasingly, climate deniers are, how should I put this? Um, they're becoming increasingly, I, I would say, in some ways militant. Uh, they're getting more extreme in their views as the scientific evidence gets better. And so it, you, I do agree that we need to, I think the better route is simply make sure that everyone, every single citizen gets the right science that everyone is well informed. And if everyone is well informed, then a few climate deniers will not have any sway. So I think education, outreach talks like this are incredibly important. Um, and I should also say that it is interesting to me that the Pentagon has, it, I didn't know about the report from last week, but several years ago they came out with a national security report uh, under the administration of George W. Bush, actually, where they said they thought climate change was the biggest security risk for the USA in coming decades. And the reason for that is if you get climate instability, then suddenly you've got people who don't have enough to eat, you get shortages in resources, and that's what drives wars. So the Pentagon, I think, has its act together. I think a lot of military heads uh, understand that the impacts of climate change are very destabilizing to society.
Yes, uh, this is not a joke, actually. Governor Rick Perry, the state of Texas commissioned a report on coastal development. Texas has hundreds of miles of coast on the Gulf of Mexico, and it's like, get a bunch of scientists together. We need a plan for coastal development over the next 10, 20 years. Scientists got together, and of course, half the report was about sea level rise, increased storm surge, and how we need to shift where we're thinking of developing, because uh, the Texas code is, is not like the Devon coast. It's very flat. So you don't have this nice elevational gain that you've got in Devon and Cornwall. Uh, so sea level rise is, is in some ways much more serious there. It's going to take up a lot more land. The, the scientific report went to the governor's office uh, and the agency, uh, Texas Center for uh, Environmental Quality, for review. Normal, that state commissioned it. They should be, have a right to review it. And every single mention of climate change and sea level rise was taken out. The scientist revolted. The head of the agency replied by saying, climate change is against state policy. <laughs> so, Yes, it, it's a problem, and apparently a bunch of other states decided this was such a great idea, and their governors declared climate change against state policy, and it cannot be included in planning development for those states. So it's a very serious problem. So the question is, am I optimistic or pessimistic about the future? I was incredibly pessimistic before going on this trip to Alaska with the evangelicals. The fact that they could turn around so dramatically not having any, not only not having scientific training, but their training had actually been kind of to not trust science, you know, quite seriously. And, but they're intelligent people and faced with the facts right, you know, in front of them, they weren't going to deny it. And they just were, were brilliant. They turned it around. And there's now a growing movement amongst religious groups in the USA uh, led partly by Richard Sizek, partly by a group called Interfaith Power and Light, who is determined to get every congregation ca uh, carbon neutral. They have 11,000 congregations signed up. So those kind of very dramatic changes, very rapid changes, actually have given me hope. Because now I see, okay, people can change quickly, and not only people, but organizations can actually go against their last century of, of the way they've been approaching life and change and start coming on board. And when you, that happens, you have a lot of power behind these sorts of movements. You can get really rapid change. So I used to be an incredible pessimist, but I won't call myself an optimist, but I have hope. Oh, absolutely. I think you've hit on one of the key challenges in education, starting with school age, but, but certainly at the university level, that we have got to start being, stop being so tunnel visioned into these strict disciplines. And we have to start not just thinking more interdisciplinary, but training our students in more interdisciplinary thinking as well as research. Um, so, yes, the politicians should have some background in science. Uh, the scientists absolutely should have some training in policy because it's very, when I first started talking with policymakers and economists, I had to get them to like me so that they'd have a beer with me at the pub and tell me what their field was. Because I said, look, I want economics 101. I know nothing. You know, teach me. And fortunately, I met quite a few climate scientists, economists, uh, um, political scientists willing to do this, that I was able to get up to speed in just a few years. Uh, and now I feel quite comfortable talking with them, 
writing papers with them. Uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm not an expert in their field. You don't need to, to go that far, but you need to know how they think. You need to know the jargon. You need to at least be able to start that dialogue and hopefully collaborate so that you can come up with biodiversity policies that make sense, both in terms of, of the conservation of biodiversity, but also in terms of what's possible within the realms of the government, what, where is the funding going to come from. You need to think about all the practical sides as well as the scientific side. So absolutely, interdisciplinary degrees, I think, are, are the new wave, and we're actually working on starting one at Plymouth, um, just the very beginnings. <laughs> so yes, I'm hoping this is the beginning of a huge wave that will take over academia and will be full of interdisciplinary degrees all over. So I think you brought up a really good point, but I do have to say that there are no isolated protected areas in Europe. I'm sorry, everywhere here seems surrounded by humans to me as, as, as an American. And, and America's getting worse too. I mean, North America, it's, it's happening there as well. Um, so, so nothing is really isolated anymore, unless you're in maybe Antarctica. Um, but yes, the tr historically, traditionally conservation, I think has tended to be very local with people looking in their backyard. Here we have this marsh on Dartmoor, we have a marsh fritillary, so we're gonna protect it. And with climate change, we need to be thinking not only regionally, but actually on a continental scales. So, and people are trying to do that. There are groups like Diversitas, a World Wildlife Fund, IUCN, Conservation International, that are, are trying to keep dialogues open across country borders so that we get protected networks that will work on a continental scale, not just on a local scale. And think about the marine protected areas. They've been having to deal with this from day one because a lot of marine species have these enormous territories that span a whole ocean. And so you've had to think right at the bat without even thinking about climate change in terms of things moving great, great distances. And so I think the terrestrial conservation biologists, we know it needs to be done. It's just sort of the organizational um, it's organizationally difficult. So yes, that's the ideal. People are trying. Uh, I wouldn't say we're there yet, but, but at least people know that's where we need to be going. And thank you again for okay. such a compelling talk um, and, and for such a profound message that you've given us this evening. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much thank you for listening.